Um, so we're going to start with a question for um, Superintendent Hofmeister. So give us an idea of where we stand now as far as the state of the budget for education. What does the current budget climate mean for education system in our state? Well, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you for the focus on education, of course, and thank you for the support of our business community. Uh, and to those in the legislature who made certain that uh, we had a, uh, that we experienced the least of cuts, uh, we are very grateful for that. Um, however, we have a growing student population, one that is increasingly diverse, uh, which means they have greater needs and greater resources are needed to meet those needs. So we are not keeping pace with that, and we have about 50,000 more students, uh, but we're operating on the same dollars as earlier in 2008. So uh, that's where we are, uh, and we do this uh, in the midst of a historic teacher shortage, which I'm sure you'll want to talk about a little yeah. bit. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Um, tremendous challenges, but um, your leadership and the work of the State Department, I know, helps all the school districts as they try to support all those all those kiddos. Um, Representative Osborne, thank you again for being here. Yeah. Um, we know that the state has experienced budget shortfalls and revenue failures in the past few years. Um, now, with the very real possibility of a special session, there are even more questions about what will happen to the state budget. What will the impact be on state education budget, if you have any clues, and do you have, or do we have more cuts in our future? Well, I brought my cheat sheet because these are the kind of numbers you don't want to get wrong. Uh, obviously, we are constitutionally mandated to have a balanced budget, which we did at the end of the session. However, we did that with several measures that have been under review by the state Supreme Court. The first has been overturned, the cigarette fee, that's a $220 million hit. But what we need to remember is with the federal matching dollars, those leverage, that's a $519 million hit to only three agencies, which was the Health Care Authority, Mental Health, and Department of Human Services. The agencies that take care of everybody from foster kids to rural nursing homes, the kind that can't handle that kind of cut. So that being said, the governor has been very far firm that she believes we need to come back in for a special session and try to fix this problem. Um, the Senate and the leadership of the House have both been a little more about let's wait and see what happens. You know, so there's a couple other lawsuits. We feel a little better about the um, how they will turn out because they were the lifting of exemption, and there is legal precedent that that can usually be withstand that challenge, but nobody knows. Um, but at the end of the day, once those decisions have been rendered, which we expect in the next few weeks, that decision will be made on special. If we go back into special and do nothing, and we allow those cuts to go into those health care agencies, that is totally devastating for our state. So I got three sets of numbers uh, just to kind of give you an idea. If we reopened the budget, put those budget cuts in and held it to all agencies. For instance, if you kept common education stable, which is something we tried to do, and let me preface by saying that I am one that understands that there is no such thing as us keeping it stable. When we say stable, we've kept it stable for 10 years, cost of living has gone up. Student population has gone up. The beautiful reforms that we had under 1017 about classroom sizes have had totally gone to the side. When you've got a teacher with 34 students in a classroom, your children are not receiving the quality education they should. That being said, if we reopened it, spread those cuts, and didn't try to bring in new revenues, kept common ed stable, it would be a 4.98% cut to all other agencies in the state for the rest of the fiscal year. If you kept the three health care entities stable and common ed and spread those cuts, it would be a 9.55% cut to every other agency in the state. If you kept all of the ones harmless that we did last year, and when I say harmless, that was at a stable funding number, that adds in things like Department of Corrections, which is already 60% overcrowded. That adds in things like District Attorney's Council, who at this point are down to such few amount of district attorney assistance that sometimes it takes five to six years to try a case. And then things are fuzzy. These are not acceptable things for core services. If we held all of those, you're talking about a 14.46% cut to all agencies. 
This is if nothing else is overturned. So I believe that there will be a push. There's three legs of the three-legged stool to come in and potentially try to do something to rectify that number, remembering that we also used a lot of one-time monies last year. If we do nothing and you don't count this cigarette fee, we're coming in with at least a $400 million hole next year we're going to have to deal with. Wow. <laughs> um, I think we often say... Thank you so much for your work in the legislature and thank you for the other elected officials um, that are in the room and not in the room for serving our state. But um, you all have some, some really hard decisions to make. We do. You've got some really tough issues. And um, again, we, we appreciate the work that the legislature does and thank you for your leadership. So Superintendent Town, let's bring this down to the real um, effect level. Okay. Um, school funding is so confusing to the average voter. You know, there's been lots of conversation in Oklahoma City and throughout the state about other mechanisms. Can you help explain the difference between funds that schools get from the state and what is raised at the local level by maybe through a bond issue? Help us understand this. And how can that money be used um, and how much control does districts actually have on those funds that come in? Okay. Well, certainly that's a, uh, that's a whole course at several <laughs> universities, but uh, schools have several uh, funds that they deal with. The general fund, which is local, state, county, and federal money, and that's the largest fund that funds teacher salaries. You have a building fund, you have a child nutrition fund, you have a sinking fund. Uh, you have an activity fund that, uh, where the kids raise money and it's for their use in their particular <laughs> clubs or groups. Uh, but the bond fund is the one fund that requires uh, a separate vote of the people, 60% supermajority, and that really is supposed to be dedicated to uh, constructing, funding new schools, remodeling, and you can also, uh, you can also furnish schools, buy equipment, textbooks are a part of that. Uh, technology and then you can buy transportation as a separate vote on there but it does take a 60 percent supermajority uh, the question that I continue to get is well why don't we take this money and give it to teacher salaries and that's strictly prohibited by the Constitution and statute so we can't really do that we fight that battle all the time but these are local funds generated at the local level that community uh, puts that tax burden on themselves what we've done in schools, though, is we've used the bond fund to help fill in the gaps. Ten years ago in Edmond, we started funding textbooks out of that fund because we were only getting $45 a textbook, and an AP chemistry textbook was $150. So we were never fully funded on textbooks. We filled in the gap. Now, recently, with some of the deregulation, uh, we are still using that money to 100% from our bond fund. So we're taking that money applying it to teacher salaries. Uh, we've done the same thing with building funds. We've used some of our bond funds for projects that might be uh, typically a, a, a heat and air renovation, and we're just putting those on bond issues now. So really, we are placing the burden of some of those things that, in my opinion, are state requirements back in the local taxpayer's checkbook. So to the second question, how much flexibility does the districts do district um, administrations and school boards have on some of the state funds that come to you? Well, there, there, is some, there are guidelines that you have to do. There's things that we have to dedicate funds to um, that come in as line items, RSA, those type of things. Um, we continually get mandates, though, from the legislature, like a mentoring program, and we haven't had mentoring funds. Uh, we choose to take some of our local funds and state funds, and we are paying teachers to mentor other teachers, even though it's not a requirement of law. It is so important that that first year, and even the second year of a teacher's career and their start, uh, is, is that critical year. Because if we don't ha they don't have a good experience, they have a bad experience, uh, they'll leave you in a year or two and go someplace else or take another job in another industry. So they have to have that mentoring to really help themselves get through. Right, thank you. So on the topic of teachers, um, back to Superintendent Hoffmeister, um, the state is on track to exceed the record of number of emergency certifications. 
and we are seeing more and more Oklahoma teachers leaving for other states or, as Superintendent Towns said, for other professions. What can we do from a statewide perspective to retain the good teachers that we have? Well, first of all, I think we do need to address the issue of an emergency certified teacher and what that means. Um, these are great people, people with a lot of heart, um, a lot of experience uh, that is not yet um, necessarily in the classroom, but are willing to be a part of solving the teacher shortage. Um, however, uh, these are individuals, most of which do not have a background traditionally um, through a college of education, so they're not going to have understanding about um, dealing with uh, classroom management. And then I want you to also put this in the context of someone who is stepping into education today in our classrooms, where our teachers are first having to deal with teaching a traumatized child increasingly so, before they can actually begin um, the kind of traditional instruction. Um, we are asking them to be social workers first. And so when you layer that on, and you have someone who's stepping in teaching something for the very first time, uh, there is a steep learning curve. We don't want to lose these folks, and it is going to take a lot of professional development support to give them the needs uh, that they have to persist and stay in the profession. Um, but an emergency certified means no one is applying who is qualified. Um, so that has increased so dramatically. 32 of those um, special situations in 2011 uh, to last year, we had 1,160. And in just two months, June and July of this summer, almost 900. Wow. So we're talking about our superintendents having to go out and recruit, which is very much like um, if you're in business, I was a businesswoman for 16 years, and uh, I would be spending my time as a headhunter instead of as an instructional leader over a school or a district who is working to provide that kind of training and support that all professionals need. And instead, they're looking for someone who they trust to step into the classroom. Our kids deserve better. And we are not going to be able to implement a very aggressive, strategic eight-year plan for education that we are launching in September that will allow Oklahomans to be on the cutting edge with innovative teaching strategies that are evidence-based to give our kids a competitive edge. Our state will not be able to compete without a competitive education in public school. And that is something that we have to put uh, at the front burner, and yes, we are grateful for the um, flat funding, but remember that that also means that flat means that the cuts of the past haven't been filled. So one example for you um, is the public school activity fund line item, and that's where reading sufficiency training for those who cannot read and are struggling, um, we draw from. That's where we have um, various programs for Sooner Start for our children who have developmental delays identified at birth through 36 months, alternative education. That's where so much of the support that we offer to our schools is funded, and that was cut by $38 million last previous year, and then it held flat, so that meant another $38 million that wasn't coming in to fill those needs, and then growing students and no teachers. We can have the highest standards in the world, but if we don't have the teachers to teach them, what good is it? So we've got to do something. Wow, thank you for, for doing what you can, and it sounds like you're trying with the resources that you have, so thank you for your priorities. Um, back to you, Representative Osborne. The Federal Bureau of Economic Analysis recently reported that Oklahoma's GDP rose for the second consecutive quarter and that in the month of July, all major revenue streams expanded compared to the prior year. With a stronger economy, what do you feel is the likelihood of a teacher pay raise for this year? Okay, so first of all, we never hear good news, so let's think about this good news for a minute. <laughs> good news. <laughs> it's, it's really exciting. So, so uh, the fiscal numbers came in for July. They were up 73%, which was, or 7.3%, which is 8.6 million. It would, let me get that right. 
This is why you bring your cheat sheet. 73 million up, that was an 8.6% rise from the same month last year. Very encouraging. We have very low rates of unemployment. That means more people are being hired, more people are paying taxes in different segments. Now, to put a slight damper on that, the Equalization Board comes in one year in advance, looks at trends of what they see on oil prices to, to job growth, and gives us an estimate of what that will be. What we did in July was met the projections of what they had said. So even though those numbers were higher, which is good, and we want them to continue doing that, that doesn't mean a whole lot more is going to flow into the coffers for us to utilize next year because it just met the projection because we saw we were coming out of the slump. But that being said, anytime you see those kind of trends four quarters in a row, you're in a recession. We have actually had two quarters now where we're going in the opposite direction, so that's a positive. But speaking with the tax commission, a lot of times when you see this uptick in the economy, it takes 18 to 24 months to actually see it start coming in in the tax collections in the Treasury. So it's a slow progress, but it's a good progress. That being said, your question was, does that mean that we can pay for a teacher pay raise this year? So everyone knows we ran several measures that would have done a uh, five-year, uh, it was up to, it was, you know, 1,000, 2003, but that takes about $53 million a year to fund a teacher pay raise, and that's in perpetuity. Are those numbers going to be there? To be honest, I feel like without a revenue measure, when we're only meeting equalization board numbers, if we don't see some form of a revenue measure to actually be the dedicated funding source, it's going to be very difficult. And that will take House and Senate and, and executive branch leadership to say that we expect that. And I mean, just talking to people across the state, and maybe I'm wrong, I think people are tired of us being Republicans and being Democrats, and they want us to fix this. I think most people... I think most people truly in their hearts believe that our children are our future and that if we want our children to be the workforce of our future, if we want our children and grandchildren to stay in this state, we've got to throw off those party lines and we've got to roll our sleeves up and fix this and make tough votes, even if it's an election year. So make sure that your representative and senators are the ones, regardless of party, that are willing to fix our future, which is our children. Thank you. Because after all, Leslie, we're all Oklahomans, right? Absolutely. Okay. So, Superintendent Town, how is your district specifically handling the decreased funding levels? What are some of the challenges that are arising from this financial situation and how are you choosing to handle them? Okay. Well, first I'd like to say that I am a superintendent of Edmond, but a third of our kids are in Oklahoma City. 25% uh, of our land is in Oklahoma City, so we consider ourselves a hybrid. So I, I really appreciate the invitation to come here today because it really is about all those 25,000 kids we're expecting this year. But uh, we continually have to deal with this budget issue. Last year was a little bit more of a, a concern. We cut $4.3 million, but we had been cutting all along anticipating it. Our budget process is a three-year process. We're always continually looking at three years ahead. So we're making adjustments now for things that we think are going to happen in two years. We actually gave teacher pay raises this year a step and uh, $400 on the step. Uh, we think things might get a little bit better, but the cuts that we made were really, I think they, they, they were sort of the essence of our school district. Administrators gave up two days of pay. Support people gave up one day of pay. Teachers gave up one day of pay. That was for the whole last year. We cut site budgets. We moved money around. We've used our building fund to the extent that we can. We've shifted money into contracts and all, just trying to get as efficient as we can so that every dollar that we have goes into a classroom. And I will still say that we're, we're still not there. Um, one day this summer, the North principal called me and he said, hey, I just lost five teachers in one day. And this is at what some people might consider like the number one high school in, this, in the state. 
to four to Texas, one to Kansas. The two that went to Texas for a Fort Worth suburb, they raised their salary $50,000 as a family. So they could not not take the job. So we still are fighting those type of things. You know, it really is just amazing that we are where we are and we're still seeing that, uh, that achievement is not falling, but in a lot of areas is going up. So that's a, the teachers that are here are the most dedicated people that you'll ever want to work with, and I'm so proud to, to work with them, and I know Superintendent Hoffmeister is as well. But we can't continue this, this curve. We can't continue this hole. In 2000, the difference in Edmond between 2008 and, and this year is we have 5,000 more kids in this 10-year period. So our budgets have gone up because of that. But the difference in what a student was, quote, worth in the formula is almost $300 difference. That's even taking out, that's taking out the FBA, the, the insurance that's paid, and it's taking out the way the Avalorum adjustments are. So if we had, we were just funded at 2008 levels, we'd have almost $7.5 million. We could give a $3,000 pay raise to every teacher in our school district, have $2.5 million for programs. Our district has eight nurses for 25,000 kids. We have one counselor for every 650 kids at a high school. We have programs in reading that we'd like to implement for, for dyslexia and all. We just don't have the funds to do it. And I would say that this year that we are going to see Edmund not be able to fill all their teaching positions here at the first of the school because we've had growth and we're trying to find teachers at right now. And we're going to see continually larger class sizes until this is reversed. And it won't reverse in one year, it won't reverse in five, it'll be someplace between five and ten years if we gave teachers a pay raise today that we have candidates in the pipeline that can come into our classrooms. Well, can Thank I just you. add Absolutely. something um, to that? We've, we have uh, looked at the last 13 years. Uh, the average length of stay of a teacher in Oklahoma is six years. We lose 46% of our teachers in the first one to five years. 46% of our overall population of teachers over a 13 year period. This is a critical problem that has to be addressed and our kids are gonna suffer for it. Every year we fail to adequately invest in what is needed with the kinds of supports we know how to give. We ultimately are divesting in Oklahoma's future. Thank you. Well, and as the business community fully understands, every time you lose an employee and you have, there's, there's significant cost with recruiting and retraining and retooling that person. So um, thank you all three so much for being willing to sit up here and talk about a tough issue for our state.